Hi, and welcome back to Football Made Simple. Jurgen Klopp is undoubtedly one of the best managers in the world. He took Mainz from the Zweite Bundesliga to the Bundesliga for the first time in their history. After moving to the Westfalenstadion, he took a sleeping giant from mid-table to consistent silverware in the space of a few seasons. A few years later, he repeated the trick, taking another sleeping giant in Liverpool back to their previous heights. At both of his latter clubs, he played with a unique style of play that had many similarities as well as some distinct differences. But what are the differences between his Liverpool tactics and his Dortmund tactics? And how has the evolution progressed? Well, in this video, we take a look. It's important to note that with both sides, he adjusted their tactics throughout the seasons. However, we'll focus on the differences in the general principles used between the two clubs. If you want a more detailed look at the tactics at both of the clubs, take a look at the videos linked at the end of this one. Formationally, at Dortmund, Klopp almost always stuck with his trusted 4-2-3-1. At Liverpool, after much experimentation in the early days, he has settled on the 4-3-3 in almost every match. Please note that all players in the different formations were given the same numbering scheme to make it easier to see how players in the same position operated differently across the two teams. Let's begin with the deep builder play. At Liverpool, his first choice has been Alisson, who on the ball provides a sharp contrast to Roman Weidenfeller. Alisson is much better on the ball than Weidenfeller and as such can more skillfully start attacks through short passing from deep and maintain possession when pressed deep in their own half. This plays into one of the major differences between the two sides as Klopp's Liverpool average a much higher possession, closer to 60% in the last three seasons, whereas during his last three seasons at Dortmund that number was closer to 50% and the keepers are the best representative for the reasons why this is. Moving further up the pitch, Matip and Subotic are both competent on the ball but usually defer to their more skillful counterparts in Van Dijk and Hummels respectively. And while both are capable of rotating the ball around the field, many of their decisions were affected by a single factor, the location of each team's best or most dangerous players, a factor that affects the way the team plays as a whole. At Dortmund, their best players for the majority of his time at the club were located centrally in Gundogan, Shahin, Goetze, Kagawa and Lewandowski. This is in contrast to Liverpool where the best players are located wide in Mane, Salah, Trent and Robertson. This meant that often Hummels looked to break the lines to get the ball into the deep lying playmaker or the advanced playmaker down the centre. And on the occasions where he did go long, it was to Lewandowski, a much bigger frontman who when required could function as a target man. In contrast, when Van Dijk wasn't looking for more penetrating passing through the centre, they aimed to get their most dangerous men on the ball, often by overloading one side of the pitch, then subsequently hitting the big diagonal to get their wide man in space on the ball. The behaviour and the roles of the fullbacks is another major difference. From deep on the pitch for Liverpool, the fullbacks are an active part of the build-up play and may start deep to help and rotate the ball around the pitch. Alexander-Arnold is particularly key to this and even occasionally tucks into the midfield. All of this is in contrast to Piszczek and Schmelzer who operate much more like traditional fullbacks looking to immediately provide the width and off the ball movement. This is exemplified when looking at the stats as a Liverpool pairing on average complete around 20 more passes each per game. And the way in which the midfield functioned also affected the fullbacks higher up the pitch. Liverpool's midfield structure means that they can cover more lateral distance on the pitch. In addition, the wide central midfielders in Henderson and Wijnaldum are hard working and willing to sacrifice themselves for the team and move into these wider regions to provide cover for the fullbacks. This means that both the Liverpool fullbacks can have the freedom to advance higher up the pitch knowing that the defensively aware wide midfielders are immediately there to plug the gap. At Dortmund, with just the two defensive midfielders, they could not as effectively cover the width of the pitch. And whilst Bender is a willing runner and could plug any gaps, his partner in Gundogan or Nuri Shahin was not as mobile. But they were also very skilled on the ball, so using them as ways to plug gaps would be a waste of their talent and as a result they stayed more central. 
This meant that as opposed to having both fullbacks consistently bomb forward at the same time, they operated on more of a one-up, one-back policy to maintain the defensive solidity and not leave themselves exposed. This also meant that in this phase, Dortmund's main ball progressor was Gundogan through the centre of the pitch, whilst for Liverpool, it was the fullbacks in Trent and Alexander-Arnold. Let's move higher up the pitch and look at chance creation and general play in the final third. The divergence in the role of the midfield continues. At Liverpool, the ball side midfielder would often drop into the half space, ready to potentially create a triangle with the fullback and the winger, whilst the two midfielders remained fairly deep. The three midfielders would rarely venture into zone 14. Only when chasing the game would one of the midfielders look to make late runs into the box. This is in contrast to his Dortmund side, who always played a dedicated 10 to roam around zone 14. In addition, when the ball was higher up the pitch, Gundogan also moved into this area in order to increase the support. A lot of this has to do with the centre forward and how Liverpool chose to deal with the deep block. At Liverpool, a false nine in Roberto Firmino is utilised, and it is mainly his role to utilise zone 14 and try and create space, usually for the inside forward to attack the half spaces. If Firmino is found in these positions, he is often the one to attempt the game-breaking passes into his fellow forwards. However, as this area is often densely packed, the three forwards tend to instead attack the box with the fullback on the ball. At Dortmund, they had a more traditional forward in Lewandowski, who while still being great at linker play, preferred to use his movement on the shoulder of the defender. This was paired with wingers who liked to play in the half spaces in Royce and Blaszczykowski, who often made runs here. Please note that whilst Liverpool's wingers made runs into the box, Dortmund's instead often attacked zone 14. So it was often the job of Goethe and Gundogan to look for the defence splitting pass to find the runs of the tucked in wingers or Lewandowski. Kuba often looked for goal when he got on the ball or to cut it back to the forward and Royce did the same on the left. But Royce or Goethe when he played here could also help to try and create opportunities from zone 14 for Lewandowski. At Liverpool, there's a much greater dependence on getting crosses from the fullbacks for the three forwards who have moved into the box. So Liverpool's primary chance creators are the fullbacks from wide, whereas at Dortmund, the chief creators were down the centre of the pitch. Dortmund looked to penetrate through the centre of the low block to supply Lewandowski, and the major goal-scoring burden was on the centre forward. Liverpool looked to go around the deep block by giving their inside forwards the time to overload the box whilst the fullback had the ball. And as a result, the goal scoring burden is on the wingers rather than the centre forward. The stats bear this out as well, with Liverpool attempting significantly more crosses than his Dortmund side. Now moving on to the defensive side of the game. Both teams would immediately look to counterpress after losing the ball in order to get on the attack quickly. At Liverpool, this is often achieved by the wingers looking to cut off the wide options, thus funneling the ball into the centre of the pitch where they could then look to spring into a press. At Dortmund, Lewandowski would often lead the press, using his cover shadow to prevent the pass into central regions. Once the ball went wide, Dortmund would then look to spring into the press, keeping the ball wide and using the touchline as an extra defender, and increasing the pressure on the ball carrier. At Dortmund, this press was much more manic and consistent, whereas at Liverpool, Klopp has refined this strategy, and just as they are now more considered with the ball, without it, they are much more controlled as well. One way this is evidenced is the injuries. Dortmund would often get several injuries to crucial players towards the end of the season, as the impact of this consistent press set in. Now, at Liverpool, they have one of the most injury-resistant squads in the league, due to this shift in pressing. Overall, Klopp picks out with both sides, turning both the Westfalenstadion and Anfield into home fortresses that opponents feared. And he enjoyed plenty of silverware with both clubs, whilst forming an incredible bond with both sets of fans. But what other differences have you noticed in his tactics between the two clubs, and what did you like most about each side? Also, don't forget to leave your video suggestions down in the comments below. But that's all for today and remember, keep it simple. Thank you.